It's really a circular pattern. You have legitimate chemicals made by American chemical companies making their way illegally into the supply chains that lead to illegal laboratories. In Colombia, they produce cocaine. In Mexico, they produce heroin or meth. And these narcotics make their way back in a circular motion all the way back to the United States and Europe, where they're consumed at great profit to the cartels. The subject of American chemical companies fueling drug production in Latin America is a pretty sensitive one, even though it's been around for a long time. When we were investigating the whole package of everything that was happening in this space, one of the best leads that I came up with was a small police unit in Ecuador that we had never heard of and that we had no idea existed that gets funding from the U.S. government and they were up against an extraordinary wave of chemicals being trafficked through Ecuador. We didn't have any idea that the heart of what they were up against involved one of the biggest deployments of border forces in Latin America and sparked a small war along the border between Ecuador and Colombia with this full-time drug lord. On January 27th, 2018, in the early hours of the morning, there was a massive explosion in a town called San Lorenzo. A stolen Mazda pickup truck packed with explosives went off, and it just created a path of destruction about 1,000 feet in diameter. You have to understand, it was the first car bombing ever in the country and it was a really shocking event. In the end, there were dozens of people who were wounded, and the focus of the explosion was a police station, the main police station in that town. Una explosión destruyó el cuartel de la policía de ese cantón esmeraldeño. Esta mañana los daños eran notorios en el destacamento, en decenas de vehículos que quedaron destruidos y en casas. The police were completely sure of who was responsible for this, and they ended up blaming a well-known drug trafficker in the region, and his name was Walter Arizala. But everybody really knew him by his uh, nom de guerre, which is El Guacho. Once the police assigned blame for this horrible explosion, they started to ask why. And that led them back a few days before the bombing, when a special police unit in Ecuador had come upon a massive cache of specialized chemicals that are used in the production of cocaine. And that chemical is called calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is kind of a strange chemical to think of when you think about cocaine. It's a very commonly used chemical for many, many different, very legitimate things. For example, melting ice on streets, keeping dust down on places like tennis courts. But in recent years, the chemists that produce cocaine in Colombia that shipped all over the world found a really good use for this particular common chemical, calcium chloride. To make cocaine, requires many, many different chemicals and solvents that are used to extract the key ingredient cocaine from the coca plant. These are regulated under international drug laws, so they're hard to get. Cartel chemists can use calcium chloride to recover and recycle the heavily regulated solvents they need. That means the chemical gives them a back door for bypassing drug laws. They can use the even more important chemicals over and over again without having to find more. As a result of this being one of the key chemicals in the production chain of, of, of cocaine, police in Ecuador and Colombia have focused intensively on seizing that chemical so that it doesn't get to the, the clandestine labs that are in the jungles of Colombia. Because once you take that out of the production chain, it makes it a lot harder to actually produce the quantities of cocaine that they need to produce to fulfill demand around the world. So the police in Ecuador formed a special unit 
solely dedicated to seizing drug-making chemicals. That's what they've been doing, so they've been quite effective. And despite these massive seizures, you still had massive volumes of this getting through, enough for the cocaine labs to make huge amounts of cocaine over the last few years. One thing that has surprised the police for these last couple of years when they've been focusing on seizing is they kept seeing the same brand of calcium chloride packed in the same bag straight from the factory of the company that made it time and time again in the back of trucks and they called it Finnish, <laughs> meaning Finland. And that's because the stuff was made in Finland by this company called Tetra. Well, the company called Tetra is actually a company based in the United States, just outside Houston. And it's a major chemical company, and one of the factories they have is in Finland. And that's where all this stuff was coming from. Calcium chloride takes quite an amazing route to get to the chemical labs in Colombia. It starts in Finland at Tetra's factory there where they actually make calcium chloride, one of the biggest factories in the world. Then it's shipped all the way to Peru to a single company that buys it in massive quantities. And then it moves across Peru to the border of Ecuador and is smuggled across the border, basically in plain sight. And then it goes by truck all the way up across Ecuador and into Colombia to what is basically the biggest cocaine producing region in the world. Tetra is not just in the chemical business, it's in the oil and gas services business. And one of the chemicals that's really critical in the oil and gas business is calcium chloride. It uses it in fracking and other fossil fuel operations. And then it has like this whole other side business of selling calcium chloride in sacks to the food industry, to the construction industry, to the road de-icing industry, to airports, using it for uh, water purification. And when the fossil fuel business goes down, they really rely on these other industrial sales to keep their sales up. So we were trying to figure out why its sales of calcium chloride had just really exploded to Peru, which was the fountainhead of all the trafficking that was happening uh, through Ecuador and into Colombia. And it was just a single distributor. We started looking through their financial statements, conferences that they did with investors and analysts, and we found just a basic description from one of their vice presidents saying their oil and gas industry had suffered so much because just fell into a slump in the US, especially fracking. And so they were really pushing sales in every other area where they could sell calcium chloride as much as possible. And that had driven, I think, a 24% boom in their sales overall globally from about 2013 through 2017, at the exact period that we saw, these sales were really dramatically increasing to a single importer in Peru. And so the company's position was really that because it wasn't regulated in Peru, that all of its sales to Peru were completely legal and that they didn't have anything to worry about. The irony was the US government was paying uh, this police unit in Ecuador to drain this illicit pipeline while at the same time a U.S. company was filling and refilling that pipeline through Ecuador through these booming sales. And the more they knocked it down, it just kept coming back up again because it kept getting refilled again and again and again. And it seemed, in the end, like nothing could stop it if the company wasn't going to try to control its sales at all. Ecuador is in a very strategic place in the cocaine trade. It's not a producer of the drug or of the uh, supplies that go into it, but it's strategically placed between the biggest regions for producing coca and transporting cocaine out of South America to the United States especially. 
it's really overwhelmed the country in a lot of ways in terms of the violence that it's brought. Cartels fight violently to keep their trade. At the center of all this is Walter Arizala, who's known as El Guacho. He came to dominate the cocaine trade in that particular region, which is the largest coca producing region in the world. And he was brought up in a very uh, desperately poor part of Ecuador. And it was also in the heart of the civil war that was going on in Colombia under a guerrilla movement called the FARC. FARC commanders recruited Arizala as a, as a fighter when he was just a teenager. He quickly became very adept at helping the FARC manage the cocaine operation that they had in that area, which was a key element that was used to fund the war that they were fighting. And he was a very good military commander as well and he was good at running a cocaine operation. So that's, that's how he came to become the principal drug lord in that region and came to be the protagonist behind this wave of violence that came after. Now a conflict that's lasted more than 50 years and cost more than 200,000 lives may be closer to ending. Colombia's president and the leader of the FARC rebel group signed a ceasefire agreement today. In 2016, the FARC guerrilla group basically agreed to lay down their arms and disband in sort of a peace deal with Colombia. But Arizala didn't want to leave the drug trade and he took a hundred fighters under his command and basically created his own private army to protect the drug trade in that region. It basically is one of the largest cocaine production cartels in the, in the world. Estuve en el movimiento por 10 años, en el movimiento guerrillero de las FARC. He did that very successfully for a long time until the police in Ecuador and Colombia started really cracking down on his operation. By the end of 2017, they'd arrested a lot of his top lieutenants, including the man who basically was responsible for acquiring the chemicals he needed for his drug labs. They were making massive seizures of chemicals, especially calcium chloride. This drug lord, Aristala, was determined to regain control over that region and over his cocaine. And he began actually chatting via WhatsApp with the police commanders in this town of San Lorenzo, saying, give me my men back that you just arrested, give me my drugs, give me my chemicals, or there's going to be trouble. And so this went on for quite some time. So the police were worried something was coming, but in the end, they couldn't do anything to stop it. And that's when this pickup truck exploded, which started what became a war along the border. And that pressure came to a head towards the end of 2018, when they essentially cornered Arisala and some of his men in Colombia, in the jungle, and ended up shooting him dead. Entraron en contacto hoy en la mañana, en la madrugadita, y ahí le pegaron los dos tiros a Guacho y que le pegaron dos tiros en la espalda. O sea, el récord dice que Guacho está muerto. They basically had gotten the most wanted man in Colombia at that time. But the drug trade didn't shut down. Someone stepped in and took control of the massive cocaine producing empire that he lorded over. They kept cranking on the drugs, which means that their uh, labs kept working, which means the chemicals kept coming. And we know this because the police commanders in Ecuador, since he got killed, have been seizing basically regular major shipments of calcium chloride time and time again. So even though this chemical, which was being sold by a U.S. company, was fueling all of this trafficking, the war on the border, it seemed like nothing could stop it, and it was all just kind of this circular trade. The U.S. paying the Ecuadorian police to drain the pipeline, and a U.S. company refilling it again over and over. And despite the irony and the circularity of what we were seeing in South America with Tetra and its product, it certainly wasn't the only U.S. chemical company that we found whose legal sales were being easily tapped by drug syndicates to produce the deadliest drugs that were being sold on the streets of America. In the 
1980s, there was a flood of cocaine production from Latin America into the United States. An epidemic of crack in New York is now out of control. Do you have no words to describe how bad it is? The CIA and the Drug Enforcement Administration in the U.S. made a rather embarrassing discovery that about 95% of the chemicals that were used to make cocaine in South America for the U.S. all came from American chemical companies. There's a list called the Red List. At the very top is a chemical called acetic anhydride, and it is the only critical essential chemical that you need to make heroin. And under international drug laws, it's one of the most highly controlled of these chemicals sold anywhere in the world, except Mexico. I went into this medical supply store with a Mexican colleague, and we bought a one liter bottle of J.T. Baker acetic anhydride. And the seller volunteered to us that he could easily get us an 18 liter jug. And with that one 18 liter jug that you can buy for about $300, you can make about a million dollars worth of heroin. The company was able to say that it did everything perfectly legally. Having U.S. companies involved in that even if it's unknowing, it just seems extraordinary to us.